good morning. Uh, welcome to the ninth meeting of 2016 of the Environment, Climate Change, Land Reform Committee. Agenda item one, um, the first item of business on the committee's agenda this morning is to consider whether to take items four and five in private. Are members agreed? Yes. Thank you. Members are agreed. Um, we now move to agenda item two, which is for the committee to take evidence on biodiversity, Scotland's progress to 2020. We're joined this morning by a range of stakeholders and academics. Welcome, all of you. Um, because of our numbers and the nature of the discussion, the committee felt this would best be done in a round table uh, setting. I think most of you are used to that, so you'll, you'll be aware of how that works. Um, what I would ask is that uh, witnesses don't have to uh, bear it in mind, they don't have to answer every question, they don't feel they have a contribution to make. Can I appeal to members also to ask sharp questions as well, so we can cover as much ground as we can. Um, you don't have to press the microphone button, that will be, that'll be done automatically. Um, can I ask everyone to turn their mobile phones off as a matter of good order? Um, we'll go round the table and introduce ourselves, um, starting with Jenny Gilruth. Uh, Jenny Gilruth, uh, MSP for Mid Fife and Glenrothes. Uh, Callum Duncan, uh, Head of Conservation Scotland for the Marine Conservation Society. Finlay Carson, MSP for Galloway and Western Fries. Chris Ellis, I'm a research scientist at the Royal Botanic Garden, Edinburgh. Kate Forbes, MSP for Sky, Lochaber and Badnoch. Mark Ruskell, MSP for Mid Scotland and Fife. Bruce Wilson, Senior Policy Officer at the Scottish Wildlife Trust. I'm David Stewart, I'm MSP for the Highlands and Islands Region. Willie McGee, Coordinator, Forest Policy Group. Angus MacDonald, MSP for Falkirk East. Catherine Lloyd, Tayside Biodiversity Partnership. Emma Harper, MSP for South Scotland Region. Adam Smith, Director Scotland of the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust. Uh, Alexander Burnett, MSP for Aberdeenshire West. Duncan Orr Ewing, Head of Species and Land Management with RSPB Scotland. Claudia Beamish, South Scotland MSP. Morris Golden, West of Scotland MSP. And I'm Graeme Day, the MSP for Angus South. So welcome everyone and let's get started. Can I begin by posing the question, uh, is there a contradiction between the findings of the first progress report on the route map to 2020 and those of the State of Nature report. Can the two reports be directly compared? Um, one strikes me as being perhaps overly optimistic, one is quite pessimistic. What's the truth out there? What's actually happening? Who wants to start? Duncan or Ewing. I, I could start. Um, I mean, I can really comment more on the State, State of Nature report because uh, we were one of the partners in it. Um, obviously, we, we clearly welcome, you know, the efforts that uh, uh, everybody is making to help biodiversity. But I think, you know, certainly our summary would be that it really isn't enough. I mean, we know that one in 11 species in Scotland is at risk from extinction. Uh, 65 species are critically endangered. And I mean, just to give an example, 18% of butterflies, 15% of dragonflies. Um, I think, uh, I mean, clearly government may present uh, a fairly optimistic view of, uh, of the situation, but I think in itself, uh, the Scottish biodiversity strategy is not going to be enough to deliver the HE targets. Okay. Bruce Wilson. I think it might also be useful to look at another indicator, the Natural Capital Asset Index, which broadly shows since the 1950s we've had a, a severe decline in, in natural capital, slightly picking up in some areas, but, but basically in uplands and agriculture, natural capital is still declining. Okay, Callum Duncan. As far as the sea is concerned, there's a contradiction because the um, priority project uh, 12 heading uh, in the 2020 route map for the environmental status of our seas looks at a uh, proportion of site, the seas in marine protected areas and that alone. It doesn't consider how they're managed. Um, I should say we welcome the huge strides that have been taken to develop the MPA network. Um, but what Scotland's main atlas shows us is that there are still many concerns and declines in the sea and the 2020 route map document is not measuring the actual status of the sea. It's measuring the amount of sea that's in, in designated sites. So 
that's why it's important to um, have adequate uh, resources in place to uh, support uh, marine monitoring strategies so that we can actually see what effect these welcome new measures are, are having on what ultimately matters, which is the marine biodiversity. Adam Smith. I never thought I'd be in the position of defending an SNH report, so this is a novelty in itself. Um, uh, but there is, re there is reason for some, uh, some uh, happiness uh, and, and uh, resonance with the, the report on the progress to date. Um, I'll pick one example in particular. It's one close to uh, our heart, as you know, the good farming practice for nature and linking nature with business and the economy. It's undoubtedly true that there's much more that needs to be done through EECs and the agri-environment uh, schemes generally, um, and we'll maybe touch on that later on in the session. But it is true that the, those schemes are supporting uh, a wide range of biodiversity, and we welcome that, that support into the farming and land management sector. Um, for example, uh, game crops or unharvested crops are a significant contr contributor of food and cover to wild birds in the countryside. Uh, they are... Uh, planted for many reasons, shooting is one of them, but the other reason is that they are supported through the agri-environment scheme. So I think the, the section that says 10 tra targets are on track for 2020 um, is probably uh, true as far as it goes. I think the challenge is going to be making sure that that's robust and actually can be followed through properly. Okay, okay. So maybe developing this a little bit further, We've got a number of reports have been referred to already. There's a, there's a lot of reporting mechanisms out there, but I just wonder, um, is what we have in front of us delivered a, in a straightforward, transparent, and an all-encompassing way as we would actually need it to be to get a real handle on the picture with biodiversity? Bruce Wilson. I think for the Scottish Wildlife Trust, in order to get a proper handle on these things, we really need the full suite of ecosystem health indicators to be developed so we can, basically taking it back to the adage of we can't manage what we don't measure properly. Without that in place, I think find it quite hard to broadly understand where we are with the HE targets and um, with the SBS itself. Is that a view that's shared? Callum. I'd agree with that. In the marine context, for example, the um, the 2020 strategy for marine recognises that um, fisheries management needs to take account of biodiversity and, uh, and the only re reporting in the, in the route map is against, as I said, the, the proportion of uh, the seas in, in marine protected areas. So um, uh, it's, it's, it, it's crucial to have that uh, application of biodiversity thinking as far as the sea is concerned in the wider seas and not just in, in marine protected areas. And, you know, we don't think the, the route map clearly reports against that uh, because there's, there's some welcome recognition in the actual strategy that um, recovering biodiversity in the sea is about more than, than MPAs. Uh, so there's... There's some work needed there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Chris Ellis. I think it's important to recognise as well that the, <clears throat> the route, the Scottish biodiversity strategy, the, the targets and the actions, they, they don't attempt to prescribe all the activities that will contribute to the delivery of the Scottish biodiversity strategy, but to set the tone of the kinds of activities that, that Scotland wants to see and steer the direction of those activities in, in certain directions to reflect the updated conventional biological diversity. So it's, it's kind of like a sampler, and it doesn't necessarily represent all the activity that's contributing to the SBS. Okay. Okay. Adam Smith. Um, there's certainly um, a lot that could be improved, and one thing is undoubtedly to tap into the interests of the actual land managers uh, who are responsible for so much of Scotland's land that is not actually designated for con conservation itself. Um, I'd draw the attention of the committee to the Wildlife Estate Scotland project, which actually encourages committee uh, land managers uh, to actually uh, audit their own assets uh, in an attempt to actually improve those downstream. Uh, there are numbers of other projects. The DWCT runs uh, partridge counting schemes, and it's very clear that where people are encouraged to join in with that scheme, 
they also see much greater than average biodiversity gains. Um, so there are certainly things in the Scottish Biodiversity Strategy reporting side which could probably tap into the enthusiasm of the land management community a little bit better themselves, uh, both as a driver and as a reporting mechanism. I think one of the other things that, again, we might take but it's a, later, but it's a related topic, is the clarity of purpose of the many strategies that are actually guiding mm. us on this. Um, we have, uh, I think I put in my note, the, the Scottish Biodiversity Strategy, a National Peatland Plan, the Land Use Strategy, the Forest Strategy, National Park Plans, a possible upland moorland vision. And we are being very clearly reported to that this is a drag uh, on conservation. There are uh, too many strategies not well joined up enough. And in fact, within the uh, SBS itself, we face the challenge, a nice example, that forest expansion, which is a headline, uh, aim for the, uh, the SBS is actually in conflict with 40% of the priority species in the SBS, which are actually open landscape species. And actually forest expansion would only support three of them. So there's a, there is a good deal of work needed to join up um, the very necessary government vision from the land uh, management side. It's not a clear strategy at the moment for many people who could be helping to deliver biodiversity in Scotland. Um, I really need to, to look for comment from the panellists whether they agree with that um, point. Duncan or Ewing? I was just going to pick up on the point about join up because an essential part of the Scottish biodiversity strategy is join up between the various strands of government. And I'm afraid the actual overarching group, the, the high level strategy group, hasn't actually met since the election. So one of, one of the comments that I'm getting from uh, members of our team that sit on the various groups uh, under the Scottish Biodiversity Strategy is there is a lack of top-down uh, direction. So it would be very helpful if that uh, high-level strategy could meet, 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 meet soon and uh, start communicating with the, the various Scottish Biodiversity Strategy groups. And that's where, of course, the join-up. Uh, we know that uh, critical parts of government that need to engage here, like agriculture, forestry, that is, and SEPA, etc. That is their point of engagement okay. with this whole process. I'm seeing heads nodding in agreement around the table. I take it that's a point that most people would, yeah, uh, that's good to get that on the record then. Right, moving on, uh, Dave Stewart, you want to develop a theme? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, clearly, uh, leaving uh, Europe, the whole Brexit issue has dominated the political debate uh, over the last uh, few months. None of us obviously really know what's going to happen since no other complete countries ever left the EU. What I want to ask the witnesses about is what the assessment the witnesses have made of the effect on environment uh, and nature generally will be from leaving the EU. For example, the effect on uh, designations, which have been uh, very important, uh, the involvement with CAP and structural funds, and of course, big issues about what happens when there's breaches of environmental designations, such as infraction procedures um, and enforcement. So it's a general question, convener, around the crucial issue about Brexit. And are there any opportunities? I personally can't see any, but maybe some of our guests and witnesses might have another view. Adam Smith. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Um, it's a, a very interesting question, uh, Mr Stewart. Um, uh, I was at a meeting uh, just last week of the British Ecological Society in Inverness. The policy team up there brought together 40 or 50 people to discuss rewilding. And the, one of the phrases that regularly appeared in that discussion was the dead hand of designation. Um, uh, it is, again, seen as uh, a necessary evil. We, we, under the European regulations, have been required to designate sites. But it is generally recognised that it, again, is a drag on people people's incentive to actually manage uh, for continued conservation. Uh, so there may well be merit or benefit in actually a Brexit um, and opportunity which would actually allow us to make those designations more flexible to support them better. This has been one of the great challenges is that we designate an area, for example, called a special protection area, which typically is for birds, but it receives no extra support in order to encourage that to, to happen. So all of the responsibility sits with the land management side, but very few of the, the actual rights that go with it, encouraging management actually are there as well. 
One of those things um, that would encourage that is support, continued support for agri-environment schemes. Um, this is going to be a huge challenge for the sector. Um, we are going to need to get our heads around the fact that farming particularly is not going to be paid in the future, we think, for producing food and fibre. Farming typically at the moment produces three things, food, fuel and fibre. It's not going to be paid to do that in the future, but it will be paid to provide the public services that make Scotland great, our landscapes that are amazing and the, the species that we all enjoy. So agri-environment, some kind of support for those mechanisms is going to be needed into the future. And the only other benefit that I can see in Brexit is that, again, the flexibility for some of those agri-environment schemes might come. There have been some very strange regulations that came out of Europe as regards agri-environment schemes. I'll take you back to game crops, which I've already mentioned. You are not allowed to use herbicides in game crops because uh, European regulations suggest that that would mean you are treating it as a harvestable crop and you might actually get paid twice. If, in fact, we actually had the flexibility to manage our game crops better, there is undoubtedly the case that more farmers would take these beneficial prescriptions up. So there are some things in there, but I'm not many, I have to admit. OK. Um, Bruce Wilson. Yeah. Back up what Adam says, I think the major opportunity, if we're thinking about it in those terms, uh, if they're if from leaving Europe, would be to create a, uh, an agri-environment uh, agricultural system that, that doesn't focus on just the traditional commodity provision, really about providing that wider public benefit. Um, I think that the conservation land management community is, is pretty unanimous in its opinion that there needs to be funding going into uh, the agricultural sector. It's just about what we specifically incentivise with that. So we're not um, paying for, for things that that we want to disincentivise, and we're paying for the, the range of benefits that farmers provide from their land. There's, there's also certainly um, a number of negative things around, um, around potentially leaving Europe. Designated sites is, I mean, for, for us, uh, we'd be very cautious about eroding anything around designated sites, but there maybe is some potential to get systems that are more suitable in some cases for Scotland. Okay, I'm going to come to Doug, Duncan or Ewing, but to, to repeat Dave uh, Stewart's point, what about the issue of who polices the delivery of this? Do you want to come in on that, Bruce Wilson? Just very quickly, not having a higher authority in terms of Europe being there is, is a worry for us as well. If there's um, potential infringement, some of these things, it would be um, worrying for there not to be a high, a high authority with an overseeing role. OK, Duncan, how are you? So I'll agree with Adam on one point and disagree with him on another. I mean, certainly on protected areas, we see them as a critical uh, bastion of uh, delivery of nature conservation in Scotland. About 15% of the land area uh, is currently designated as either a special protection area, special area of conservation, or site of special scientific interest. These are the jewels in the crown of our natural heritage and need to be defended, we would argue. I mean, the critical issue is really how they are funded in the future, and we would look for some reassurance from Scottish Government that they will underpin uh, the current funding that is delivered largely through agri-environment and European funding uh, into the future. Um, more widely, uh, the whole issue of, of funding both of agri-environment and other projects, uh, so going back to your point about what other uh, issues have, have occurred, if you like, as a result of uh, the Brexit decision. I mean, the other major concern to us is that uh, quite a number, of, particularly of the big projects that are identified on the route map of the Scottish Biodiversity Strategy, we'd be looking for funding from the likes of the European Life uh, funding pot of money to, to deliver those. Uh, given the current uncertainty about uh, uh, the future of that funding. I mean, I'm involved with a project myself, the Western Atlantic Woodland Project, which was a large partnership project, £11 million. We were hoping to access £5 million of European funding. Uh, that is currently in abeyance, largely due to the uncertainty around the future of life funding. And, uh, you know, all I would say is uh, if we're going to deliver the big projects that set out on the uh, set out in the biodiversity strategy, we need some certainty that uh, uh, the Scottish Government will underpin uh, life funding existing agreements and agreements that are planned. Can I just one additional point before the other witnesses come in? Um, 
clearly, I understand that there might be some repatriation of our structural funds and um, agri funding is crucially important, and that both the UK and Scottish Government made some commitments on that. But a technical point I would raise with witnesses who may be aware of this, once the Article 50 is delivered and there's the two-year negotiation, um, once that trade deals are sorted out, we revert back to World Trade Organization rules, which we're obviously a member of as well. And members be, will be aware that the World Trade Organization rules are quite clear that there can't be unfair subsidy, in their words, of, of farming. So effectively, um, schemes that we currently have would not be eligible under World Trade Organization rules. And of course, once we're out of the EU, it's crucially important that we're, we're still actively involved with WTO as well, our member currently. But that is, is, is obviously been extremely worrying to farmers and crofters across the whole of UK. And I don't have any witnesses I've got any specific points on that, because that is definitely unknown territory. And do you want to come in on that? There's no one disagreeing with you, Mr. Stewart. <laughs> we are first, can you? <laughs> yes. yeah. OK, let's move on and look at some of the specifics here. Um, Peatland, let's start with that. Uh, Emma. Thank you, Convener. Um, it's restoring function in Blanket Bog is a long-term process and results to date are preliminary. So I'm wondering whether action on peatland is focused largely on one geographic area, like Caithness, Sutherland, the flow country, and if so, what action is required to restore peatland elsewhere? And what are the barriers to doing this, like funding or lack yeah. of engagement? I, mean, I think it's worth making the point before anybody answers that, that the evidence this committee is taking around climate change is that we're missing a trick with peatlands in that area. Are we in any way missing a trick with peatlands from a biodiversity perspective as well? Who wants to go first? Could I just make a quick point on that, just about community involvement? In, in peatland restoration, if, if that, rather than come back afterwards, mm -hmm. if that could be included. No, that's fine. That opens it up. Uh, Thank you. Who wants to go first? Bruce Wilson. Um, yeah, there's been some, some good progress in the route map on peatlands. I think everyone would agree with that. But come 2020, with the targets that are in there, it's certainly not going to be job done. I think it was the uh, low carbon report that suggests up to 21,000 hectares a year of peatland restoration is technically feasible um, and we're going to need greater ambition to, to reach that target. The, the kind of benefits of investing in peatland restoration now are that it's relatively cheap compared to doing it when the, the peatland asset is, is eroded. So I think putting in money now would, would actually save us a lot of money but also deliver the extra benefits like community benefits if you, if you have proper engagement. Um, the carbon sequestration that we've talked about, but also the, the biodiversity and uh, flood, flood prevention benefits and, and, and water storage. Um, yeah, I, I think tied to that is uh, one of the, some of the barriers that we hear repeatedly to uptake is short-term funding cycles. I'm, I'm sure Adam will back me up that if you're if you're a landowner, you're certainly not going to do something on a on a short term cycle, especially with something like peatlands that take a long time to restore properly, and so we can realise the full benefits from. Okay, Willie McGee. Yeah, a peatland doesn't sit naturally with with forests, um, but um, <laughs> certainly in, in, in the forest policy group, uh, we we've taken um, views on a on a, a number of different issues and. The, uh, w w one of our concerns, and certainly in the uplands, is the, um, f first of all, peatland generally across Scotland. So in, in relation to geography, I, I w don't think it's confined to the north of Scotland. Um, we have peatlands in the southern uplands, which um, uh, can be degraded um, through either burning for land management, um, overstocking of either sheep in, in the southern uplands or deer in the, in the highlands. Um, and these, th this kind of interface with sporting strays slightly uh, from, the, from the, the forestry and the, and the peatland, but we see that the, the deer issue and sporting in, in a climate change, and by that way linked to peatland, it, it's, they, they need to be considered in the round. So considering them in isolation is, is, is not a great thing. Um, we um, have had, just to um, 
address Claudia's um, um, input there. We, in, in the Southern Uplands, we've got a, a peatland, a very modest, small peatland restoration um, effort being um, carried out by Borders Forest Trust in um, the Moffat Valley. Um, and I think it is something that, um, certainly with the government's land reform agenda, that, that peatland management, peatland conservation, peatland restoration, um, these are all things which um, can be in, in the, in the uh, competencies of communities. So where communities get access to land, um, either exporting land or ex-agricultural land, um, they would be as fit as anyone to, to manage these areas. Okay, anyone else? Uh, Adam Smith. Uh, thank you. Um, yes, I'd certainly uh, endorse Bruce's point. Um, the, a long-term sustained funding stream is absolutely essential for, for land management opportunities. There are good examples uh, in the estate land around the farm that the GWCT runs up in Aberdeenshire. Um, estates which are enthusiastically keen to close up the bare peat that's been exposed in the hag ground at the top. Uh, they've done a little bit of it, uh, but the funding has then um, fizzled out and has not been available to, to complete the rest of it. They find that very frustrating, uh, especially when they're willing participants. Um, one of the other things that we find is a drag on um, uh, actually getting peatland restoration in amongst the land management community is that they think that there might be biodiversity downsides, so re-wetted areas. Uh, may not actually be so good for some of the breeding birds that we uh, all appreciate, particularly the wading birds, which are already under pressure. So very, very wet ground is not absolutely ideal for some of the species such as golden plover and curlew. So we have to be a little bit cautious about that. That's brought up with us. And the other is that there may be a farming downside. Um, there's a, a splendid uh, plant called the bog asphodel, which, uh, when browsed by sheep, uh, can cause uh, photosensitivity of the skin to such an extent that it actually causes the ears to become damaged in lambs and, and fall off. Um, bog asphodel thrives in increasingly wet conditions, and this is actually a, a genuine drag for quite a lot of upland farmers on re-wetting their ground. Now, I don't think it's necessarily more than a perception in both cases, but there might be some low-key, uh, both facilitation, maybe a little bit of research, he said, which would actually help set some of these fears to rest and actually encourage people in restoration more generally. On the sporting side, I think you're absolutely right. I think all of these things, uh, grazing and tracking, is not just about deer, it's also about sheep and cattle. Uh, all, of, all of that impact needs to be considered in the round. And uh, on, on the community front, uh, I think if there are areas which are not being used um, productively for biodiversity or productively for farming or forestry, then the community might well take an interest and do some quite good things with a relatively small amount of money as well. Yeah. Duncan or you? Just very briefly, Chair. I mean, the Scottish Government's Low Carbon Scotland report has indicated that about 21,000 hectares of peatland restoration is feasible per annum. Uh, currently, the run rate is between three and 6,000 hectares per year. So I think we acknowledge good progress, but we need to keep it going for the range of reasons that were outlined uh, earlier, you know, climate change and... Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, Finlay Carson. Just on, on the back of that, is, does anybody uh, think there's a, a identifiable, a, a identifiable conflict of interest between the, the peatland restoration and the, the government's planting targets? Would that conflict be significant? William McGee. Good question. Um, it shouldn't, it. because peatland is excluded from planting. planting um, however, there's been an allusion already to the quite aggressive planting targets. We <coughs> endorse greater woodland cover. Um, the route that the Scottish Government is going down in forestry, which if we had last year's committee would be in here with us, um, is being pushed increasingly towards external large-scale investment um, and the areas where you go when you've got large-scale investment are the uplands. Um, there is a move within investment forestry and that's dictated by pension companies, investment companies and they are trying to push the Forestry Commission to um, move on to 50, 50 centimetres of peat. So there, is, there, isn't, there are moves behind the scenes in the industry, and that's in order for them to meet industrial targets. 
we would take the view that that is entirely unhelpful and should not be countenanced. But um, I, I think that there, there are ways, we, we're not here to discuss the planting targets, but there are ways of achieving what the Scottish Government desires in terms of the planting targets without going down a route of um, a foresting peatland or taking out valuable upland areas. Um, it's just that the, the drivers that we have at the moment are big and they're external investment. So uh, that, that drives forestry in one direction. So we're, we're, we're kind of moving back to the 70s and 80s, if anybody can remember that. I think, I think uh, your contribution just weighs bare how important it is to get a fully functioning land use strategy in Scotland. <laughs> uh, Bruce Wilson, briefly. Yeah, you've just exactly made my point, Graham. Yep, land use strategy is essential to try and work out what we need and where, so just buy that up. Just quickly on the peatlands as well, I think it's important to recognise the progress we've made on leveraging public, uh, private sector financing, things like the peatland code that can help pay for projects and, and make that link between the, the provider of the, the, the peatland resource and, and someone that might be looking to invest. So I think it's just important to note that. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to move on to um, looking at the issue about outdoor learning. Uh, Jenny Goldruth. Convener. Um, the progress report states that Scotland is on track to provide 100 schools in 20% of the most disadvantaged areas with access to quality green space for outdoor learning. Um, and obviously that feeds into the government's attainment agenda. Um, I'd just like to ask um, the panel whether or not their organisation has a role to play in terms of outdoor learning, what kind of barriers they might have faced in so doing. So, for example, uh, local authority funding. And secondly, I'd like to ask the panel whether or not they have a view on the provision of quality green space uh, in schools. Um, as a former teacher who taught in a school which was surrounded by a sea of concrete, uh, I think there's a, a key role to be played by the provision of green space um, in schools. So I wonder if the panel has a view on that. And also in terms of how the provision of quality green space in a school uh, setting can actually help to impact upon mental health um, in the education environment. Okay, I'm going to wait. So, uh, Catherine Lloyd, do you want to come back on that? Yes, I was just thinking we've been writing for quite a long time um, a teacher's guide to biodiversity because the one thing that we're not really engaging in on a local situation uh, is where can they go? You, you get this situation of there's so many places to go but they're being stopped to do it. So we're trying to sort of turn it round. It's a bit old-fashioned but we're getting there. We haven't published this document at the moment but it will be available nationally once it is. What's stopping them from doing it? I think the sort of health and safety is the vast, that is the key priority, or we can't be seen to be doing it. However, I think by working with local communities that then bring the, their own local schools in, that we're getting around that. Um, for instance, there's an East Haven in near Canoosti. Uh, there's an absolutely ma amazing local group there, local community, but they're not waiting for anything. They're going straight to the, the local schools and getting them in, um, involved heavily. And I'm being able to go in and saying, how about championing certain species? The small blue butterfly is in their area. So I've got in mind to try and encourage them to come out and help with our kidney vetch planting, for instance, and we'll get round that. So I think you have to, it's, it's one to one. I think if, if at the moment it's very, very difficult to try and say, let's have a, a policy because the health and safety comes in or the cost of getting people, the pupils back to, from school outside. It's just not possible at the moment. If any other witnesses want to give a plug to my constituency, feel free. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Willie McGee. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, 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 you, you talk about individual organisations. Um, I mean, the, the Forest Policy Group has members like the Community Woodlands Association, um, the Association of Scottish Hardwood um, Sawmillers and, and others, some of whom are, are active in, in education. And um, the, so from a forestry perspective, it's the Forestry Commission who have facilitated a lot of the, the outdoor education getting school children into green spaces, forests, local forests, whether it's Craig Miller in, in Edinburgh or in Duncoilich, which is in not near Carnoustie, but in uh, Highland Perthshire. Um, and the, the forests have provided an enormous, I mean, you, you just have to look at the forest schools literature in Scotland to see what an impact that's made. The impediments, as you would guess, are teacher's time and resources. Less health and safety 
from our perspective, because when we run forest schools, we haven't encouraged children to open knives, saws, leap in fires. But, but parents, when consulted, are very happy that children are exposed to these things because they don't get that kind of experience anywhere else. So I think there's, there's huge potential, certainly in, in forestry, and there's one forest I would like to recommend. It's, it's called a Abriachan, it's above Loch Ness. And what they've managed to do is combine forest schools education, adult learning, support to, to women who are in the justice system, to branching out, which is a mental health um, initiative to get people into into green spaces and um, particularly forests, and and it's kind of a backhand, Adam, in in, uh, in relation to the the communities. This community took on what is essentially a commercial forest, and if you look at the public benefits that have flowed, particularly in education, from removing it from a conventional forest owner to a community, they're staggering. Okay. Um, just picking up on Catherine Lloyd's point, I certainly hear as a, an MSP stories about um, some wonderful locations seeing a downturn in the number of school children who are going there. And the reason that I keep hearing is the cost of hiring um, transport. Is that something that's been spotted across the country? Um, Adam Smith. Yes, certainly. Um, you've put your finger on one, one, of the, one of the main problems with uh, getting schools out. Um, it's also one of the ones that's reasonably easily um, fixed in many ways. There are actually lots of local businesses we've discovered who are prepared to sponsor those kinds of transport activities and write that off down to their social engagement and things they think they ought to do. So it's not an insoluble problem. And in fact, we managed to get recently uh, a couple of hundred kids. Uh, it's a plug, I'm afraid, for Fife, not for Angus, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, and, and indeed in Midlothian as well. We've managed to get groups of school kids to come out and plant hedges on some of our demonstration farms. Um, we're, we also were delighted to work with the Royal Highland Education Trust. And the combination of farmers who are willing and the Royal Highland Education Trust and ourselves, we haven't found a massive difficulty in getting um, the, the countryside-based kids out. One of the one of the challenges we have faced is that a lot of the teachers themselves don't really have any countryside resonance. They don't really see how they can do it. So there's, there's perhaps something in the Scottish Biodiversity Strategy that we ought to be looking at teacher training uh, as, a, as a key part of, of, of actually breaking down a barrier for them. You know, the countryside is not scary, it's perfectly accessible, uh, exactly the sort of thing that, that um, Willie McGee was saying as well. Um, the, the other thing that GWCT's noticed and we're trying to address in partnership with Countryside Learning Scotland is an absence of residential um, educational uh, opportunities. Um, it's, although you can go and stay at places, wonderful places like the Field Studies Council building in Kondrogan up in Strathardl, there's nowhere that you can actually go and stay on a working farm in a structured environment. Um, these are becoming more commonplace across the UK. They're not available in Scotland. This is something that we think uh, really ought to be uh, made available. It's quite specialist, it's quite high end, but you can actually get quite a regular turnover of people who are going in and spending, kids, kids and teachers who spend two or three days actually learning how a farm actually works on the ground. Um, the, uh, on a personal matter, my family are entirely teachers and my uh, aunt has just recently retired as a head teacher in Edinburgh and one of the things that she noticed was green space uh, in her school was absolutely vital. Again, she enabled that to happen by local business support. It doesn't require a huge amount of money. It does require a little bit of a capacity of going out and being brass necked and asking for a, bit, a little bit of cash. But um, yeah, these things are achievable and very beneficial. Okay, um, Chris Ellis. So, uh, the public engagement with nature and um, support of um, within within the curriculum is something that at the Botanic Garden, where you know it's a sort of it's a space that we're very familiar with, and um, we have a program of continuing professional development for teachers, and we've seen two thousand teachers trained on that program over the last five years, and we have school children participating in projects where they come to the garden. They have a foot, a square foot of soil in which they can grow their own food, and they can, we can have these repeat visits where they, they learn about urban gardening, and they learn about the, the ecosystem benefits of, of soil and um, <clears throat> integrated food production. And a lot of that in the past has been done on site. And in, in a sense, the garden is a, is a safe space where we can bring children out of their communities 
into this new environment and engage them with nature. But there's some quite innovative projects like the Cumbernauld Living Landscape, Edinburgh Living Landscapes project, where the aim of those projects is to bring together different partners who can then benefit from, from um, shared access to infrastructure. So in Edinburgh, for example, that includes the Botanic Garden, but it also includes the Council and the Parks Department. So aside from what's already in the Scot Scottish Biodiversity Strategy, I think it's important to recognise some of these other, other partnership schemes that are taking place around Scotland. OK, we've got a lot of people trying to come in on this, so let's get through this. Uh, Duncan. Briefly, our understanding is the same as yours. I mean, we run some of the biggest outdoor learning uh, operations in Scotland at our Loch Winnoch Nature Reserve in, uh, in Renfrewshire and at Loch Leven in Kinross, close to your own constituency. And what we hear is it's the cost of transport uh, to bring kids to these sites that's one of the biggest issues. OK, Bruce Wilson. Just very quickly, um, I'm a current scout leader, so I spend a lot of my time at weekends taking kids out into the countryside. Um, we noticed cost being an incredibly uh, difficult barrier, especially in more urban areas to get to remoter areas, obviously. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of um, things that we do to address this as, as the Scottish Wildlife Trust. It's mainly about identifying champions locally, so things like local wildlife watch groups. Um, that can devote time and energy because that's a problem as well as lack of time from adult volunteers. It tends to be the kids around wanting to experience this stuff. It's the lack of adult volunteers. Uh, I think it's a very good example of the importance of getting the Scottish biodiversity strategy right. It's not just about the biodiversity. It's about the wider benefit to communities okay. as well. Okay, thank you for that. And finally, Callum Duncan. Yeah. Just to emphasise the importance of the the support that some of the local biodiversity partnerships can, can give at MCS. We have our Sea Champions Initiative, we have Cool Seas Explorers raising awareness of education of the sea through education work. Um, we've many groups doing uh, beach leader surveys and including a lot of school groups. And we've worked with um, Tayside Elbat, we've worked with Fife Elbat, and that's helped us to get a record number of beaches take part in our uh, big September beach clean um, and that contributes to the marine litter strategy which has links to the biodiversity strategy as well so um, just underlining yes some groups can take the initiative to do it themselves but the the local biodiversity ac action framework is really helpful in in order to help facilitate um, getting the sort of projects we run um, in, into the community and getting more and more uh, young people and other community members involved and I'm presumably we would all agree there's a role for MSPs in this around the Species Champions programme in terms of raising awareness and engaging with the schools in, the, in their area. Uh, Callum Duncan. Yeah, absolutely. We had, we had um, several uh, Species Champions and MSPs along at our uh, beach cleans in September, so thank you. <laughs> No, it, was, it, was, it was more a challenge rather than <laughs> opening the door for you to praise the MSPs because it strikes me that the programme we properly implemented has that capacity in it. Um, Jenny Gore, do you want to come back in any of that? Oh. Well, I, I suppose in terms of the green space, um, the second point that I raised was about mental health and how that impacts upon children's mental health, which is something that we've looked at in Parliament recently. Um, there are issues around about that at the moment in terms of children's health and well-being. And I suppose, from my perspective as a former teacher, there's certainly a role for green space to play in improving that in the classroom. And I don't know if you have any evidence on that or any opinions that you, you might like to share. Or if you don't readily have it to share, you could write right. back to the committee, <laughs> if that's OK. OK. Can I... Can I we'll, we'll need to move on, but can I throw something in? Adam Smith's referred on a number of occasions to drags on progress. Can I explore with the panel to what extent climate change is making meeting the biodiversity challenges that we face harder to overcome. Chris Ellis. We talked before about designated sites and um, <clears throat> we can see examples of how the kinds of flexibility that, that have been discussed will become necessary in monitoring our designated sites. So for example, in the Cairngorms National Park, when we uh, undergo site condition monitoring to look at the status of those sites, what we're starting to find is a decline in the populations of species for which those sites are designated. 
and that can lead to those sites uh, failing their site condition monitoring, which brings into question their status as a designated site. The decline in the populations, uh, uh, populations of these snowbed species or Arctic alpine species as a consequence of climate change. So the question then becomes, as these species decline as a consequence of a, of a global challenge like climate change, is it justified to, uh, for that site to sort of lose its special designation? Or do we need to be less prescriptive about the species we expect to occur in a place as species start to migrate and respond to climate change? Or is there some other set of characters around which we value our designated sites other than the species that were there when they were first designated? So some flexibility about the status of those sites, I think, is going to be really, really important. OK. Don Goodall, are you in? I mean, there's no doubt that climate change is, is a major issue for conservation and uh, pleased to be having this discussion here. I mean, the example I'm going to give is actually uh, in relation to Scotland's uh, internationally important seabirds. If, if for any bit of biodiversity Scotland is important, it would be our large uh, seabird colonies. Um, I think uh, our view is that certainly in the face of climate change, we shouldn't give up. I mean, clearly with the seabird colonies, we have a major issue that they're, they're, the food supplies of the seabirds are moving as a result of climate change, which is causing starvation and things in, in some of the colonies. Uh, but there are things that can still be done to mitigate cl against climate change. And one of the major issues with seabirds is you can help protect the colonies by removing non-native species, for example, uh, particularly rodents from, from seabird islands, improve biosecurity on those seabird, seabird islands to actually give those seabird populations the best chance and uh, make them more robust against the challenges of climate change. Okay. Uh, Carl Duncan. Um, I think if th there's a, a, a virtuous cycle if we manage to get marine protected areas management right because then we're restoring habitats potentially that can uh, both lock up carbon whether it's kelp forest seagrass beds oyster reefs um, or can protect and or can protect against the effects of climate change in terms of uh, coastal erosion so you know again it's about investment if we're if we're investing in the protection and monitoring of these sites so that we can see the potential deliver benefits they're delivering um, you know that can help make those places and Scotland sees more widely more resilient to climate change uh, and very quickly we talked about peatland restoration that's why we're um, uh, keen partners uh, in a project in Adorna Firth with Heriot Watt University and Glenmorangie looking at scoping out native oyster reef uh, restoration there used to be a, a, an oyster reef in the Firth of Forth uh, the size of Edinburgh for example and that would have been doing a lot of uh, seawater filtering um, uh, carbon locking up and providing food and so on. So there's, there's, a, there's it's about looking, investing in, in monitoring and protection in order to demonstrate the potential benefits and uh, learning as we go. Adam Smith. Um, I endorse uh, Duncan's uh, position on this. Uh, climate change is a, is a potential challenge to, to SBS delivery. Um, it's going to be obviously a challenge to the Alpines, as Chris has pointed out. It's a, it's a challenge to delivering on the curlew and probably the cone bunting and the cone creek uh, as well. When these species are challenged by uh, declining weather, and particularly in Scotland, that's, that's increasing wet, rainfall events, we will need to make sure that um, the rest of their population dynamics are relatively unchallenged. And so Duncan's point about mitigation is, is critical. This is very clearly demonstrated for the capercaillie. It's not a priority species, uh, sadly, in the Scottish biodiversity strategy. We think it ought to be. But the capa is very clearly affected um, by increasingly wet uh, conditions in its core range. And where that is happening, it needs to have all the other parts of its population dynamics absolutely squeaky clean so that it can survive these uh, vicissitudes and stochastic events. OK, thank you. OK, let's move on and uh, look at um, forestry, native woodland. Uh, Alexander Burnett. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you uh, relevant interest in forestry is in my register of interest. Um, I'm sure we're all well aware. We've, we've touched on the uh, planting targets already. I'm sure we're all well aware uh, that the targets haven't been met for the last six years of, of 10,000 hectares a year. Um, it's been discussed here previously that in the climate change discussion, this target you know, 
should, should be nearer 20,000. Um, I was wondering, uh, probably particularly to, to William, um, what he thinks has gone wrong in a, trying to get to those targets already, what needs to change, uh, particularly the focus on restoring native woodland. Um, and I know we've touched on um, the in, uh, investments, uh, forestry vehicles looking to expand the area available uh, on, on the soils depth, but you know, the targets were set on, on the existing land available. Um, why hasn't that been met and what needs to change? Okay, um, like a lot of like climate change, it's, you know, it's not straightforward, but in essence, what we have is quite a blunt instrument to engage land owners um, and uh, communities across Scotland and to encourage them to plant trees. Now, what's happened um, as some of you will have detected in the last few years, is we've had a sort of a swing away from large-scale native, um, what they used to refer to as the pinewood schemes in the Highlands, where um, uh, there were considerable areas that were, that were coming under native woodland. Um, and when we had the advent of the slipper farmer and the retreat from the hills in the northwest, we had a lot of regeneration, if you like, of, of native woodland. Um, but the, the concentration on large areas of monoculture, essentially Sitka spruce, which is what we're told industry desires, but you know, if we were having a, a technical industrial forestry conversation, it's not specifically what they require. Um, that's where the, the focus has gone. Now, if you're going to persuade hill farmers who own three, four, five hundred hectares of land that there is a, a good reason for having a proportion of their land taken out of um, sheep farming or, or, or whatever. Um, it, first of all, it needs to be attractive to them, but secondly, it, it needs to be non-threatening. And what we've got at the moment is a focus on purchase, so large blocks of land. And uh, we in the Forest Policy Group believe that, th that these targets could be met, not easily, but they could be met and more if you concentrated on uh, a, a, a if you like, the Forestry Commission persuading landowners to put modest amounts of trees. They, they're not, if you put 50 to 100 hectares, has windbreaks, has shelters, has native woodland, they can see returns from native woodland now, biomass and the advent of, uh, of, of wood heating has changed the whole dynamic of the forest sector, the industry certainly, so native woodlands are no longer not paying, they can pay. Um, for, for, for good prices. Um, it's just that we've got this current fixation, if you like, on, on these very large areas without much of an incentive for the bulk of the landowners in the uplands, the farmers, the, the estate landowners, to put, if you like, more modest and more diverse woodlands onto their estates. So it's partly education, it's partly outreach, and it's partly a, a shift in emphasis. The, 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 if you go to the statistics, it's the highlands that you'll see that are most obvious by their absence in large-scale planting. For some reason that the forest industry cannot answer, estate owners like planting large-scale Scots pine plantations and restoring Caledonian pine wood but they're not that keen, keen on putting 500 hectares of Sitka spruce. And if there was more incentive weighted towards those type of schemes, you would see bigger areas coming into the targets. Specifically, if a forestry grant scheme is adequately funded, I mean, I know there are additional payments for the small blocks of uh, um, uh, mixed broad, the MBL. Diverse, uh, diverse, diverse conifers, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah and and native woodlands. Uh, speaking it, of experience, there's a higher cost with planting smaller blocks in, you know, in fencing, establishment, management. Uh, than larger blocks. Yes, I think the, uh, the, the scheme that we had prior to this one um, was very encouraging. What we've had is a shift in emphasis. When you plant Sitka spruce, it doesn't matter whether it's small or large, you don't need fencing. Deer are not in any way interested in Sitka spruce, which is why it's a kind of default for the industry. Higher costs go with doing the more interesting, the more biodiverse type of woodlands, and that's where the funding is, is not being targeted. Uh, you have, of course, mentioned the D word, deer. Um, <laughs> does, does anybody uh, want to feed in on, on the issue of deer at this stage? Because clearly it's a major uh, player 
on, on biodiversity. Uh, Duncan, or you? So, uh, presently, we have the SNH review of deer management mm. that's underway, and we look forward to that coming to this committee for scrutiny. And we certainly encourage uh, this committee to take a keen interest in deer management matters, because uh, in terms of addressing some of the condition of our designated site issues, expansion of native woodland, a number of the areas where we've talking talking about here, deer management is a key issue. I think it's 18% of the uh, protected areas in Scotland are in unfavourable condition due to the impacts of deer browsing, and this is mo mostly in upland areas. Um, I'm a, I would also add, I mean, the FCS have carried out a review of uh, our native woodland resource. There is significant opportunity there to both to improve the condition of that native woodland and to expand the resource. And uh, at the moment, 70% uh, of our uh, special areas of conservation uh, for Western Atlantic woodland, for example, again, another of the jewels in the crown of Scotland's natural heritage, important for mosses, liverworts, and uh, other biodiversity, are in unfavorable condition and the primary cause of that is rhododendron infestation. Mm. So we would certainly encourage uh, this committee to ask for the National Rhododendron Strategy to be published, which... Yet uh, another strategy. Yeah, <laughs> which FCS have, but importantly, that, set, that will set out the programme for restoration of these, uh, this native woodland resource. William McGee. Dear, yes, where do we start? Um, the Iraqi committee heard uh, quite a lot about, about deer, and I'm, um, I'm sure you will over the, the lifetime of this committee. For, for forestry, deer is a, an enormous uh, issue. We, we spend tens of millions of pounds on not only deer control, but deer fencing. After this meeting here, I'm going to drive to the Scottish borders. Uh, myself and a syndicate have bought a tiny piece of land outside Walker Barn. We're going to order three kilometres of deer fence for uh, an area which we're planting with native broadleaves and cannot be left, like Sitka spruce. Um, and this is a cost which the, the taxpayer is contributing to, but they're only contributing a percentage to. But all over Scotland, any scheme that obliges people to plant native broadleaves or any other conifer other than Sitka spruce feel the impact of deer. And I endorse what Duncan has said. Uh, yeah. If you don't mind, could you quantify the cost? It'd be useful to get a feel for how much it costs, the, not just the taxpayer, but yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> right, so at the moment, what the, the Commission do, they, um, they have a, a, a means uh, of assessing grant and what they will award you, and it's called standard costs. So they have a mean cost for, say, deer fencing in Scotland, and they will give you up to 80% um, of that. At the moment, it's six pounds per metre for a functioning roe deer fence. Roe deer different to red deer because the mesh is smaller on the bottom. We are paying 10 pounds a metre in the Scottish borders on ground, which is not that difficult. A group I act as forest management manager for in Perthshire are paying £15 a metre for deer fence. So depending on where you are in Scotland, you can be laying... And, 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 the, and the, the Carafran Wildwood project had eight kilometres of deer fence. If you're a big landowner in the Highlands, you may have tens of kilometres of deer fence. Then you start to get an idea mm, of, of, the, of the cost. OK, thank you for that. That's, that's very useful. Uh, Adam Smith. I'll just chip in... Um, Trying to join up two bits. Uh, we talked about Brexit earlier on. Um, we're just uh, in the fortunate position of having got a, a Life Plus grant uh, from the European Union to study the effects uh, or the, the, the usability of lasers as a fencing tool in agricultural and conservation contexts. <laughs> I can absolutely assure you that it doesn't. <laughs> These are very low powered lasers. They've been in commonplace use in the Netherlands for, for goose control for many years. And um, I suppose the point that I'm trying to make is that, uh, yes, deer are important, a very important issue, and we need to continually be looking for both the right balance of density and numbers of deer and, and incentivizing people to actually control deer as part of a, a well-managed game management program. So they're actually getting some value out of controlling the deer. They're not just a pest but also actually looking for some new solutions. And, and one of these might well be some technological fixes. Instead of having to put 
hard forestry fencing in may be that we might actually be able to discourage them with these very low wattage um, laser systems, which apparently animals thoroughly detest. And we'll be trialling that over the next few years. How do, how do they, they work in practice? Uh, OK, well, at the risk of getting too much into a detailed conversation, um, these are um, lasers that produce a spot of light um, about, about so big. Uh, and the wattage that they produce is lower than a typical laser pointer that you would use in a display. So they're very, very low power. Um, and you've all seen a laser when it's projected onto a surface, and it's got a curious sort of moving mm -hmm. content to it. A very, apparently animals find this exceptionally disturbing. Um, they treat it as a predator, or, or, and they, they exhibit typical anti-predator responses. So you don't, even, you don't shine this on the animal. It is a, projected onto a surface, and animals will stay well away from it. The Life Plus grant is a business development rather than, a, rather than anything else. It's particularly looking at whether we can use lasers to reduce rodenticides in the countryside by keeping rats and things away from feed stores and other food supply systems, um, and thus benefiting things like barn owls and whatnot. Okay. It's not going to be a fix for everything, no. but it's, uh, the point I'm making is that there may be technological things, okay. and we should certainly be looking for them. Interesting. David Stewart. That's a very interesting point. I think I've also seen some scientific uh, work done around high-frequency noise that also has some effect on that. But I think the point, going back to my Brexit argument at the start, convener, is that um, what this is about, I think, is ensuring there's more research and development that the academic community are better funded to look into this. And, of course, the, the great worry about Brexit is that you're going to lose a lot of the academic funding through the rise in funding and others. And many academic institutions, not least Denver University and UHI, which I've <coughs> close relationships with, have also come out saying that they're really, and SAMS and Open are very concerned the effect on academic research in the future because of the lack of EU funding uh, because we're not going to be in the EU. Adam Smith. It's certainly far from ideal. I mean, the information that we're getting at the moment from the research side is that we would still be warmly welcomed onto European pro projects. Um, in fact, our European partners have said very clearly that, that it would be cutting off their noses to spite their faces to not have Scottish and UK partners involved in the future. Uh, but it's pretty clear that we wouldn't be able to lead those projects. Uh, so one of our North Sea regional projects, uh, which has got the tremendous acronym of Partridge, for my organisation anyway, we actually lead that, um, and we would not be able to do that in the future. The LIFE project is led by Liverpool John Moores, and again, they would, we would have to go and find a, an, an EU project leader to do that. So that is a, that is a downside, okay. but we would still take part. Thank you. Duncan, are you? Just going back to Deer very briefly, just to remind you, I mean, the Land Reform Review Group report recommended we move to a system of socially responsible... Uh, deer, deer management, and that's that's got to be the objective. Uh, obviously, the the progress in terms of deer management planning, uh, the work that your colleague Mike Russell has done to improve some of the legislation around deer in the Land Land Reform Act is all very welcome. Uh, but what we really need to see now is implementation of these deer management plans to see if we can hit that objective which the SNH report should shed some light on. OK, um, let's move on to look at freshwater habitats. Uh, Finlay Carson. Thanks, uh, Convener. Uh, my question is, uh, what work has been done to identify and understand climate change impacts on freshwater habitats and associated biodiversity? Um, my interest is particularly on whether we've got enough scientific information baseline info regarding mixed fisheries, migratory fish, and potential cyclical patterns. Who wants to answer that? <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> Bruce Wilson. Sorry, and then we'll... I don't know. I'll let Bruce Wilson in first. He beat you to it. Sorry. I have mean, just a very quick point about what we were discussing earlier, with the ecosystem health indicators, establishing that baseline is key. And in order to do that, we, we need to, to put a bit more work in the ecosystem health indicators and bring, bring that back on track. Okay. Adam Smith. We're looking forward eagerly to seeing what the, the World Fisheries Review could actually bring, uh, bring into focus, because uh, the opportunities that the ASFB and RAFTS uh, integration, which we hope is going to happen, uh, could, e could easily provide some, some really useful opportunities for actually improving data collection in freshwater and salmonid, particularly for our interest systems. Uh, we run a fisheries research centre down in Dorset, uh, which is a chalk stream salmon river, a slightly different thing. But the 
the techniques that we've learned down there could give a certain consistency, which would be extremely useful for Scotland. And, and so I think we, we applaud the, the opportunity that the fisheries review and restructuring could, could give for Scotland. Okay. Right. Thank you for that. Um, can we look at the Natural Capital Index, uh, Kate Forbes? Thank you. So the report states that Scotland is on track in ensuring that businesses are more aware of their reliance on natural capital. However, there's still limited evidence um, to suggest that business investment in natural capital asset has, assets has actually increased. So how do we solve that? Looking also at how we can develop better metrics. Bruce Wilson. Yep. So, um, yeah, that's, that's broadly accurate. We're, we're doing... Um, given the amount of resource devoted to it, a, a fairly good job at making Scotland's businesses aware of their impacts and dependencies on natural capital. That's through things like the World Forum on Natural Capital, um, kind of bringing attention to Scotland from a global scale, but also the Scottish Forum on Natural Capital as well. Recently, the Scottish Forum on Natural Capital organised a business breakfast on the theme of resilience, but bringing in natural capital in there and really trying to highlight um, yeah, what, what impacts and dependencies business have on that. It is, though, very much at the stage of education at the moment, and it probably will be for quite a while more. There isn't the, the depth of understanding in Scottish business yet, um, apart from uh, some obvious sectors. Uh, agriculture obviously understands that it, it has, has uh, a dependence on a healthy natural environment. We just need to uh, get the funding right so that they can help build that natural capital rather than, than uh, sort of depleting it. Um, I think funding will be an issue um, going into the future with the Scottish Forum of Natural Capital, which is the, the group that's been charged with, with taking this forward. At the moment, the, the group um, relies on small contributions to, to take the work forward. And in order to really highlight investment opportunities for business, I, I think there will have to be a, a greater investment in that to allow it to, to take it forward. I have also previously mentioned um, the Peatland Code as well, I think that's quite an important exact first example of, of uh, business being able to invest in, in natural capital assets. We also have something that's been developed by a group called the Natural Capital Coalition, called the Natural Capital Protocol. Sorry, bear with me with all these things. Uh, it's essentially a step-by-step -step guide on how to implement natural capital in your business, and that's taken a long time to develop. A lot of people have implemented into that from, from the world of business, NGO and academia. And excitingly, the Scottish Forum of Natural Capital, Scottish Land and Estates, and um, Crown Estate are hopefully going to take forward a pilot study of that on, uh, on, a, on a working land business, so we can try and share some of the learning from that and, and help disseminate that across business in Scotland. Okay, right. I think that's covered that quite extensively. Thank you. Can we move on to look at the issue of we, we've already covered. I think uh, quite extensively the issue of youngsters going out and experiencing nature. Well, what about older people, um, Emma? Thank you, Sandina. Um, I'm just curious about the benefits of experiencing biodiversity um, for the wider environment, and you know why is it that some people across society as a whole are are not accessing um, the outdoors? And another we thought I had was, is it really necessary to have outdoor spaces labelled as national parks? Or, you know, can we just say to people, get out there? Who wants to answer that? Willie McGee. Uh, not all of it, just a part of it. <laughs> <laughs> In national parks, one I would leave to others. Um, yeah, why are more older people not getting out there? I would hesitate to suggest that it is to do with um, resources and um, finance and, and, and really where you are. Um, I think that we, um, certainly when I was at Borders Forest Trust, had volunteering for, for older people, um, retirees, people who were on their own, who found it valuable to go out in, in groups and participate, whether it was tree planting or just going for a walk or, or um, uh, doing some other woodland management task. But again, you came up against the same 
or, or something similar to the getting young people out, and that is that um, a lot of these people were in Gala Shields Hoyk. They were in. They were in. They were in. They weren't in great housing. They uh, didn't have that much in the way of resources. Public transport. So you needed to get minibuses. You needed to to, to make them aware of where the activity was taking place and um, to try and pick them up. So I think the, y your, your question covers a societal thing, which is about you know, m m encouraging people into the outdoors. Um, it has tended to be something that they, those with resources and money, the middle classes and others, could do very easily. But getting people in urban situations that's why the Forestry Commission, with their woodlands in and around towns, you know, trying to get the green space. We had the discussion about green spaces and the value of them, um, and actually, uh, you know, in introducing people where they're not, um, they, they don't feel uncomfortable. You know, it's a bit like with mental health issues. People, you know, to bring them together and to take them out as a group, uh, you need resources. You need to have people who are um, properly trained in that. So it 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 is it is possible. Um, and I think it should be encouraged. Um, again, in, in Perthshire, we're taking people from Aberfeldy, Pitlochry, Dunkeld, and taking them out to, to a site one day a week. They do relatively light tasks. They feel that they're making a contribution and they're getting something out of it, but it's not straightforward. It's not easy. Okay. Um, Catherine Lloyd, I, I recently visited the Morton Trust in your patch. And one of the things that came out that day was that very often the youngsters are there, they're involved in the activities there, but then they come back, they bring mum and dad, aunts and uncles and whatever. And that, that strikes me as something that's probably repeated across the board. So we're not seeing youngsters going out as much. That opportunity to encourage adults to, to then follow is being lost. Is that a fair observation? Very much so. I think in, in a lot of our projects, we start with the children or the young people, but then we try and encourage them to have family days if so, if we have a sort of something happen, happening on a Friday, how about bringing your parents back and doing something on the Saturday? And that's happening more and more right across the board. Swift projects, amphibian projects. One thing I would mention is our Be Wild project that we've been um, trialling in Angus, and we really very much hope we can get funding to widen it, and that is working with care homes. And rather than expecting them to come out and explore areas, which they can if they wish, but a lot of them are uh, too ill for that now, or too elderly, but we're taking in um, opportunities for wildlife kits. They can choose whether to have a pond or patio planting of, for pollinators, um, orchards, it doesn't matter what. They get a whole choice of what would they like in their, in their area, and then we're making sure that they're getting it with an enormous amount of information um, as well so that they can actually take that forward. And that is so uh, exciting. They're coming to us. We could have done 30. We only had 11. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> Emma uh, made the point about national parks and perhaps the awareness that they create, but we've got two organisations here in the SWT and the RSPB who own uh, a great many wonderful sites across Scotland. I guess a question for both of you. Do you do enough to raise awareness of what you have to offer out with your own membership? Bruce Wilson? Uh, certainly, yeah, we, we try our hardest. Um, probably the, the best two examples that Chris already mentioned, the Cumbernauld Living Landscape and the Edinburgh Living Landscape. Um, one, just to quickly refer to the other points as well, I think we need to stop thinking about nature and biodiversity as something we get in a bus or a car and drive to, we need to integrate it in our towns and cities. And that's not just so stakeholders can enjoy it and benefit and feel all these uh, additional benefits. It's, it's so that our towns are more resilient, uh, you know, they're not as hot, they're, they're, you mm -hmm. know, there's a whole host of things that, that, that can, we can get from that. Um, within Cumbernauld, we have a programme called Wild Ways Well, which is addressing mental health issues from, uh, all, for all ages, really. Um, these, there's, there's, there's numerous examples of these projects, and that's, that's using green space immediately adjacent to where people live uh, and, and work. I think that, that is very important, especially for, for older generations who possibly can't move as far from where they stay, and it also addresses a lot of social justice issues. We, we increasingly see um, the, the kind of poorest members of society with the least access to green space and the richest with the, the greatest 
access to address that balance. I think before I let Duncan or Ewan come in, I think we're straying into a territory that Angus Macdonald wants to explore. Do you want to come in here now, Mr Macdonald? OK, thanks, uh, Convener. Yeah, I mean, clearly um, we've discussed green space for uh, outdoor learning and education um, and for, for older people. However, our, our health service uh, can, can benefit too. Um, the progress report considers that Scotland is on track to improve green space quality and use on at least one hospital or healthcare facility in each NHS board on mainland Scotland, eh, which includes developing and promoting a green exercise toolkit for use by the health and environment sectors and delivering an NHS green space demonstration project. Um, and we have a prime example eh, at Forth Valley Royal Hospital in Larbert, where there's a tremendous facility through an, an exciting partnership eh, with Forestry Commission Scotland and Central Scotland Forest Trust. Now, um, we know that studies show that having a good view from a hospital window can uh, help a patient uh, with their recovery, uh, and it also seemingly uh, helps reduce the use of painkillers, which I wasn't aware of until I did a wee bit of research two seconds ago. <laughs> um, and um, clearly, uh, there's also other benefits that um, even five minutes of green exercise can have a positive impact on, on mental health. So I'd be keen to know, I mean, we've heard some examples already of, of where panel members have uh, ensured that um, projects have gone forward, but have any panel members been involved in any of these projects and have there been any barriers uh, to uh, delivering um, through the NHS? I thought, Duncan or you, the point I made earlier about do you reach out beyond your membership, and in doing that, do you actually cross-promote you know, SWT mentioned in RSPB, does that go on quite actively? It would be good to get that on the record. Yep, OK, so a few few uh, responses here. Firstly, uh, we've increased our family offer on reserve, so like was suggested earlier, if you get the kids engaged, quite often you can get the adults engaged as well. Volunteering is the other tool that we use. Uh, across our reserves, we have a network of both residential and day volunteering offers. Uh, in connection with uh, Mr Macdonald's point there uh, and the Larbert Hospital, which is actually my local hospital as well, um, I would suggest, and I'll check after this meeting, whether there is contact being made. We're involved with a major project called the Inner Forth Landscape Partnership, uh, which again ties in local communities uh, and the natural heritage of the uh, Inner Forth area around Falkirk, Stirling, Clackmannan, uh, that area. But it may be that uh, contact can be made with the likes of Larbert uh, uh, Hospital uh, to join that up better. I, I accept that, so please take that as, a, that as an offer. Um, otherwise, uh, like uh, SWT, we are working in partnership at a landscape scale on a lot of, in, a, in a number of places now across Scotland, which does mean working in partnership with other ENGOs, private landowners, and others because we realise that uh, delivering our objectives for both biodiversity and people uh, can't, be, can't be done just simply on nature reserves. It has to be done uh, more widely in the landscape. Okay. I don't know if that answers your question. No, that does not. Yeah. Uh, Adam Smith. Yeah, I, was, I was going to refer back to, to the point you were making, I'm afraid, not, not so much on the, the NHS side. Um, there might be merit in taking the countryside to people. And if there was one plea I was going to make, it was, uh, it's a great shame that SNH have seen budget cuts backs, which mean they no longer can attend, uh, in anything like the, the level that they used to do, the things like the Dundee Fruit and Flower Festival, the Royal Highland Show, the Scottish Game Fair, which we run, the Perth Show, the Dundee Fruit and Flower Festival. These are superb points of engagement for the adult population. Um, and it's a great shame that SNH can't actually take part in those more fully. Um, if people are willing to attend these non-specialist people from the countryside, I think we ought to have uh, people there who are actually able to support them. Can, can I, just for a point of clarity, um, yeah. SNH were at the game fair this year? They were, but the, uh, a discussion I had with them last week uh, has revealed that they are very seriously considering their uh, public-facing offering at okay. these kinds of shows. For example, they pulled out of the Moy Game Fair quite recently, and I believe the, the level of investment, even in the Royal Highland show, is, being, is okay. under consideration. Uh, I think that will be a matter that we'll have the opportunity to explore in a few weeks' time with SNH, mm -hmm. so we'll, we'll bear that in mind. Thank you for that. Uh, Chris uh, Ellis. Yeah. Sorry, it, it refers to a point that was made about uh, elderly access to um, 
to, to green space. And again, just emphasising that one of the key issues is that blurring of the boundary between the countryside and the urban landscape to make people aware of what's around them and as the uh, urban landscape changes, the benefits, the benefits to that. And there was an interesting study um, performed in, in Sheffield a few years ago where they polled people's sense of well-being in different environments and people felt best where they perceived there to be the highest biodiversity. But those sites didn't actually have the highest biodiversity. So there's a disconnect between people's perception of a biodiverse landscape and a landscape that might be biodiverse or performing important ecosystem functions. And I think it relates to the, the, the point about um, people's sense of well-being and, and what drives that and understanding the relationship between landscapes that people enjoy, which might be parkland-type landscapes, and landscapes that are actually very, very diverse, which might be uh, native woodland, which feels slightly more threatening. OK. Uh, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, convener. It was just to um, see if there were any observations from the roundtable today about um, the contribution that their organisations or, or any issues they know about um, in relation to biodiversity and connections with people with disabilities. Because in the National Performance Framework, that was um, highlighted that people with disabilities had um, obviously less access, but I'd be interested to know what, um, if there are any groups that are doing something proactive about this. Uh, if Bruce Wilson. Um, yeah, a number of our reserves we have, uh, and as, as with uh, other groups around the table, specific access plans for uh, people with disability. But I think it comes back to making the distinction, not making the distinction between nature in, in the countryside and in towns and cities. If it's available for people to enjoy and experience woven through our, uh, our kind of, uh, you know, an urban and rural setting, then there's more opportunities there in general. Okay. Uh, Callum Duncan. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that the Green Conservation Society, we, um, you know, we all respond to groups that want to do beach cleans, for example, and we've had groups with different abilities, and, and obviously we'll, we'll take that on a case-by-case -case basis depending on access to the beach and what it's like and, and, and to help deliver a, a clean that suits them. So we're, we're responding to that. And, but, but if I may follow up on Claudia Beamish's point, how do you go about spreading the word that you do that? Because there may be a, a perception on people with disabilities part that, you know, that's beyond their ability to access. Would it, how do you get the message out there, Bruce? Friends of groups um, and a lot of local partnership working. For example, in Cumbernauld, we have a, a, an education officer who doesn't just have a remit for schools, goes around a whole variety of, okay. of groups to try and get the word out. Okay, right, thank you for that. Let's move on and look at improving ecological connection. Morris Golden. So improving uh, ecological connection is a key goal for this parliament and this committee. We have some examples of this in Scotland with the Central Scotland Green Network, the Urban to Garvin Nectar Corridor. And I was wondering from the round table if you could reflect on any lessons learned from those two initiatives, how they could be expanded, and also um, how a national ecological network could come about and your uh, assumed definition of uh, said network. Uh, Bruce Wilson. Sorry, yeah. Um, so the, the National Ecological Network for us in the SBS route map, we, we want to see quite a lot more progress on that. We think that the National Ecological Network is actually the way to meet a lot of these targets. Um, Adam said there's quite a little bit of confusion about uh, the number of plans and objectives and things that are out there. We see the NEN as a way that we can thread biodiversity through, through almost everything that we do. Um, we'd like to see it link through the land use strategy, the marine plan, uh, the route map, and also the national planning framework. It will help address things like uh, access to wildlife in our, in our towns and cities. We'd like to see it become a material consideration in planning applications and, um, and strategies. Um, we'd like to see it take into account licensing regimes and allocation of forestry and agri-environment spend. I think there's been some some notable successes with the Central Scotland Green Network and uh, 
you know, Glasgow Clyde Valley. We need to expand that so that it doesn't just concentrate on our, our main central Scotland corridor. It misses out vast swathes of the rest of Scotland, and we can be doing a lot more across across those areas. Okay. Anyone else? Could I just throw a quick question for everyone, so we don't come back? Uh, hopefully, um, is there actually a consensus on what a national ecological network means in practice? That has been highlighted by a number of people to me. Okay. Duncan or you, and you wanted to come in there. Yeah. I I haven't got an immediate answer to that question from Claudia Beamish, but um, you might be able to answer that, Bruce. Yes. Yeah, so we have, um, as Scottish Environment Link, I assume everyone is familiar with Scottish Environment Link, um, have been tasked with coming up with a, a lot more succinct definition than the one that we proposed in 2013. But essentially, a national ecological network for us is about providing strategic direction on where our green space goes. Um, it's not necessarily always about physical networks, but it's providing that coherence through policy so that everything is working towards um, better ecological outcomes and the, the benefits that, that, that come from that. We, we need that because the Scottish Biodiversity Strategy alone won't do enough to, 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 for us to meet the IHE targets, basically. OK, thank you. Uh, Duncan, what so, are you doing? So just to say, we welcome the fact that the National Ecological Network is included in the National Planning Framework, and it needs now read across to all of the other significant Scottish Government strategies, the land use strategy, marine strategy, and so forth, because this is where the join-up happens between, you know, the three important pillars, really, of the... Uh, of the Scottish Biodiversity Strategy, which are around sites, species, and wider countryside uh, conservation. And if you get all of that right, that delivers the six big steps that are identified in the Scottish Biodiversity Strategy route map. And uh, from our perspective, I mean, we would be looking really, if you are going to uh, help save nature in, in our countryside, we would be looking at about 20% of the land area of Scotland to be managed benevolently uh, for nature. That, that will be a combination of protected areas, but also through agri-environment schemes, working with private landowners, communities, and so forth. OK. Um, you mentioned sites there. Let's move on to uh, an area that Mark Russell wants to explore. Yeah. I was just going to reflect on, on that last comment, actually. It'd be interesting to see how these ecological networks are actually embedding into local development plans and actual real planning decisions on the ground as well and whether cognizance is being, is being taken of those. Um, but yes, thanks, Convener. I mean, just to move on to um, protected areas. So we've had a bit of discussion on that this morning. I think Adam described them as a drag and Duncan des described them as a jewel. Um, but the, the progress report says that about 80% of our designated features um, were in favorable condition by 2016 and that project's effectively complete. Now another issue, issues around uh, the definition of favourableness, um, is, that, is that figure of 80% giving us the full picture of what's actually happening with our important features, species and, and habitats in Scotland or is there a, is there a wider picture there? Duncan or you? Wider picture, I mean SNH have a major landowners group partnership which is uh, tasked with tackling favourable condition issues and it includes uh, the major NGOs but also includes the likes of the Forestry Commission, MOD and other significant landowners uh, in Scotland. Um, that figure that you have there, 80%, I have to say, uh, if you start drilling down to the figures, you will see that uh, certainly the ENGO favourable condition figures and the Forestry Commission are actually significantly higher than that. Uh, when you, I mean, you have to take out of these figures also uh, some of the sites where there's no remedial action. So we talked about seabirds earlier, climate-induced uh, changes in food supply. Um, it's very difficult to see how you can get, uh, you know, sort out some of those problems that are beyond control, if you like. But where there are remedies, we still could be doing quite a lot better. Uh, particularly on private land through agreements through SNH and so forth. Okay. Anybody else? Willie McGee. Yeah, I think in the um, 
forestry world, we would we would take issue with um, a figure of 80% being applied to native woodlands, for instance. Um, we believe that the the indicators that were used in terms of favourable condition um, did not pick up on um, some of the basics that we would have looked for. Um, the uh, presence of structure, different diverse structure within woodlands, regeneration, and again, I don't want to use the D word, but you can guess where it's all going. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, but yeah, we, we would not, 80% I think is explained in part by what Duncan's said um, from different sites, but the, the bulk of ancient and native woodlands in Scotland suffer um, from... Can, can I ask what opportunity you have to make points like that to, to influence these <laughs> figures? Uh, no, we, we get an opportunity uh, to chew SNH's ear. Um, I sit on a round table with Deer, with, with, with Duncan, although there is a robust pushback, I think would be fair to say, Duncan. Mm -hmm. um, and th this is it, really, I suppose, okay. in, in respect to much of it. So we, we are very grateful and thank you for the opportunity to do this. Okay then at the Scottish Biodiversity Committee, um, where you've actually got all the stakeholders and the minister around the table. Yeah, as you said, it hasn't met for a year. Um, but you know, could that be the forum to really resolve some of these issues? Because this is quite a high-level target here. It's quite a high-level target. The Scottish government can say that's great. You know, we're meeting this. But then, if there's if there's a if there's a wider, more detailed issue under that, then you know, we need to understand the reality yeah. of what's on the ground. Did, I think. But, but before you answer that, just to be clear, Mark Ruskell said it hasn't met for a year. What was said earlier was it hasn't met since the election. Could somebody clarify when it last met? Um, I don't know. I know definitely it hasn't met since the election. Okay. All right, well, we can look into that as a committee. Thanks. Sorry to interrupt you, Mark. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Just to get clarity on that. Anybody want to answer the very specific points Mark's made? Adam Smith. Um, it's a very good question. I suppose the 80% the, the is very encouraging. I think one of the issues that, that we have is with the resilience of, of that 80%. Uh, if there's something behind that figure that we're aware of from one particular project that we're engaged with, engaged with including the RSPB and SNH and others, is the Langham Moor demonstration project. And that's the resilience of actually main, making sure that that, that gain is, is kept good. Um, there's a lot of uh, need to focus on the motivation and the incentive to actually keep that keep that going. So it's, it's all very well and good to get to the, the apparently positive position that we're in now, but how resilient is that in the background is something that we need to be aware of. And what are the things that are going to keep these sites in good condition is not at all clear at this stage. Okay. Do you have any further points about funding? We've already talked about potential withdrawal of EU funding, Life Plus. Etc. But uh, are there any other financial challenges around how we ensure that these sites are favourable, where we can take action? Yeah, can I, I mean, respond? I mean, there is uh, previously uh, progress in this area was driven by a hard and fast target that SNH set. Um, more recently, it has become a bit more flexible and nebulous, and it would be useful to have that target reinstated uh, to concentrate people's minds around what needs to be achieved. Um, there are areas, uh, particularly around agriculture, forestry, uh, and, I mean, I mentioned rhododendron removal earlier. That is a major one where we could make progress to improve the target. 18% uh, of sites are in an unfavourable condition because of overgrazing issues. Uh, these are either deer management or agricultural overgrazing issues. So these are issues that, uh, you know, are feasibly addressed. Funding is an issue. I mean, I mentioned earlier we're, we've been involved with this Western Atlantic Woodland Life Bid, which aimed to address unfavourable condition in a number of Western Atlantic Woodland SACs from Morven down to Loch Lomond. Uh, unfortunately, due to the uncertainty, Brexit has created in the, the future of life funding, but also the concern that uh, RSPB is left with a £5 million uh, black hole, which we then have to support and uh, the concern that we might let down over 300 landowners involved with that project. Uh, we have had to uh, pause and rethink with our partners. Um, but as I said earlier, you know, a number of these major projects that are on the Scottish Biodiversity Strategy route map, which help deliver favourable condition, like that project, 
are at risk because of the funding concerns at the moment. Uh, Chris Ellis. <clears throat> like to make the point that um, where those where those percentages of, of favourable favourable condition refer to, to species, it represents um, it perhaps represents an opportunity because populations in designated sites don't exist in isolation, but the size of those populations and their genetic diversity depend on uh, linkages to other populations in the wider landscape. And uh, for long-lived species, they may persist for a long time in a protected site in a process of, of decline, and that could take uh, decades or, or centuries. And so we shouldn't see those percentages as, as um, the end point of success, but as an opportunity through uh, greater ecological connect connectivity to, to protect them in the future. Okay. This kind of moves us on into the area of um, being told that considerable investments being made and good progress has made, been made with some high-profile species. But there's also evidence that suggests that other species and habitats aren't failing, uh, faring as well. Why would that be the case, and, and what more do we need to do? Do we need to change focus, emphasis, what? Duncan, or you? key tool for, for dealing with uh, the wider and more dispersed species in our landscape. As I say, there are three pillars, really, to delivery here, site, species, and wider countryside. And the wider countryside measures are often driven or delivered through agri-environment schemes or, or forestry schemes. And, you know, really, again, uh, having some certainty about the future of agri-environment schemes and forestry schemes, uh, given the Brexit situation, uh, would be very helpful and would allow people to, uh, private landowners, ENGOs and uh, others to actually invest and uh, help improve the prospects of those species. Adam Smith. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is the, the special plea here for um, the land management side to be given its uh, head on this. Um, these special species are, are an absolutely fantastic hook for land managers. Um, I think some of us, all of us, maybe, maybe struggle with the idea of ecosystem services, but if you're working to actually support a species, uh, that's a, a very uh, clear management target. If uh, the Scottish Biodiversity Strategy could be developed in a useful way, it would be in three ways, and that would be to build in its capacity to adapt um, to changes in the, in the current landscape, uh, both the predation pressure of climate control, and that adaptation uh, and that adaptive management approach doesn't necessarily need money. It, it in many senses, might need a, a policy support mechanism. You could facilitate um, land managers to actually help themselves. There's a lot of interest in farmers, moor owners coming together. The ECAF fund has recently uh, brought together a group of moorland owners in the Cairngorms. We are forming farmer clusters in uh, Fife and Midlothian. And these are guys who are self-motivated to actually do conservation, but they need some help, some facilitation to do that. And finally, this issue again of coordination and clarity of purpose in our, in our biodiversity requirements. Um, that would be enormously helpful for people who uh, are being challenged to produce certain, certain species. Um, over, overall, as I say, this, this section here uh, could very, very easily be ramped up with the active support and engagement with the land management community. Uh, that's the bit that's probably missing from the SBS in, in, in enough capacity at the moment. Okay. Um, Callum, Duncan. Those could be extended into talking about the sea as well, the need for a three-pillar approach, the marine nature conservation strategy, which the 2020 strategy recognises is important for delivering uh, for biodiversity, um, uh, in includes, I think, the first uh, uh, statement of it, the three-pillar approach needed. Uh, and that's what we need for biodiversity at sea as well. So it's not just about MPAs, it's about uh, marine planning and fisheries management delivering for biodiversity and species protection. Uh, but the, the marine uh, nature conservation strategy also recognises the import importance of taking an adaptive approach to network development and management. And this is where I reflect on the um, 2020 route map from SNH, which recognises, yes, we've got 16% of season and MPAs, but future challenges are developing the evidence base, and we need that not only to um, identify um, potential other places for protection, but to identify how those sites are doing, 
to, uh, again, as I've said before, to try and demonstrate the benefits. Uh, and we've seen that in Lamlash Bay recently, University of York, University of Bangor study showing a more than doubling of catch per unit effort of, of lobsters there. But the other challenge is actually delivering measures to effectively manage MPAs. And if we can get more evidence of the benefits of it, we, you know, we hope um, uh, more and more stakeholders can be supportive of these things because we very much, as Duncan says, view, view them as jewels. They're, you know, they're not a drag. And I just want to support, again, what um, SNH have said about in terms of meeting these challenges for effective management, which we need for IHE targets, um, uh, we, uh, we need to collaborate and work together. And just to put for the, on the record that we are committed to continue to do that because a lot of works, a lot of progress has been made, including overseen by this committee's predecessor, and we, uh, you know, are committed to to continue to help see that um, uh, progress continue um, uh, with forthcoming sites and uh, management measures. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Willie McGee. Yeah, I mean, for forestry is a double-edged sword in this, that it can play a, a very beneficial role and also provide habitat for species that are not doing so well, um, or on the other hand, it can be viewed as a, as a, as a threat, um, depending on what type of forestry that's being pursued. Um, the, uh, the, the, the joined up thinking bit, I think, for, from, from our perspective, would be if this committee um, and grouping, if you like, were in dialogue with those in the, in the forestry, um, the, the rural economy, committee um, about the nature of forestry expansion, about what it is that's happening in the, in the hillsides, um, and to make a plea for more diverse forestry, um, a more sympathetic forestry, and one that both landowners, communities, uh, environmental NGOs can all sign up to. Um, and, and I think that would be a, you know, a positive. It's going to happen. We're going to get forestry expansion. Let's have it. Um, where it benefits um, biodiversity and communities. And, yeah. Yeah, just picking up on the, the marine point there, Claudia Beamish. Right, thank you, convener. Um, I'm very pleased to have heard this morning about how marine issues and coastal issues have sort of threaded through the whole discussion on biodiversity because that's not um, always been the case. I think in the past it's been seen as sort of something a bit separate and, and it obviously isn't. Um, so a lot has been highlighted already, but if there are any other comments from the panel about um, uh, really building on the comments that um, Callum Duncan's made already about gaps in coverage and also um, for, for the marine network, ecological network, and also what actions can be taken to ensure the success of the MPAs, which I know Callum's touched on, but I'd like to know if there's any views on what are the key barriers to these. And we talked about there being so many strategies, but I am going to ask about the relevance of the national and um, regional marine plans in relation to biodiversity as well. So if there, if there are any observations from anyone um, about those questions or more broadly about marine biodiversity, they'd be very welcome at this stage. Callum Duncan, thankfully. <laughs> thank, thank you. Um, I mentioned the three-pillar approach, and the wider seas pillar is all about delivering for biodiversity through uh, nature conservation, marine nature conservation through wider seas measures, such as inshore fishery management, but also, crucially, uh, regional marine planning. I'm glad you asked that question because it allows me to recognise that sustainable management of the sea and delivery for biodiversity is about managing all activities, uh, including you know, agriculture, oil and gas development, renewables, um, recreation activity, and so on. So, you know, marine, regional marine planning is the, is the excellent opportunity that we have to do that. Um, obviously, we're in early stages of it. Uh, we'd like to, we, you know, we would hope it would be effectively resourced, um, appropriate stakeholders would be involved, and, uh, and that, uh, you know, it is integrated with uh, the aims of the main nature conservation strategy and the biodiversity strategy to be proactively looking at biodiversity protection and enhancement as well. So there's lots of opportunities there, and, and that's an important space for stakeholder collaboration. Um, uh, you know, as as is live at the minute in, in the Clyde, for example, uh, and, and we're committed to constructive engagement with that. Um, in terms of in terms of gaps, I'm quite conscious in talking about that because th uh, there's been 
you know, great bounds made over the, over the last few years, 30 new nature conservation MPAs, Europe's largest harbour port was SAC, consultations on 10 seabird SPAs and five offshore SPAs, and uh, we very much welcome uh, Rosanna Cunningham announcing the um, historic MPA for the Iona One last week and the demonstration research MPA for Fair Isle at our annual conference in Edinburgh. Um, and that, that brings me round to that, um, your point about uh, you know, barriers and, 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 and uh, being progressive and constructive. And I think Fair Isle is an excellent example of that. Um, uh, because that proposal is, was supported by a whole range of stakeholders, uh, and, you know, and we wish that that proposal well. And we know that the um, the, the Shetland Fishermen's Organisation was involved, and FEMETI and National Trust for Scotland, Green Scotland, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, uh, you know, likewise, you know, there's, and there's different examples of it. Um, you know, I touched on Lamlash Bay. Obviously, South Arran has had had a lot of discussion about it. Um, <laughs> You know, we think the outcome for that site was appropriate, uh, uh, but you know, the important thing is, no matter where on that scale of of, of uh, um, uh, you know of of, of, of uh, approach or stakeholder perspective, MPA co-management is is really important. Um, and whether that's Soundabara or Arran or Fair Isle or anywhere. Uh, uh, and we, you know, we'd like to see that collaborative approach. We'd like to be involved. Uh, we've we lead on a, C, a citizen science project called Sea Search. We've got a, we've got citizen scientists, divers underwater, actually finding new places. We've had them in Scapa Flow, finding new records of uh, flame shell beds, fan mussels, horse mussel beds. But we're also in, they're also in places finding evidence of of damage or decline as well. So we're committed to provide. Uh, uh, you know, contribute to the evidence base, as well as the sort of policy and management discussions, and, and to do so, con you know, constructively and, okay. and transparently. Mark Russell. What's the most important change that the Inshore Fisheries Bill could make? Um, well, we were pleased that this this is the first programme of government that had a commitment to inshore fishing legislation in it. Um, I mean, obviously, that's a, a big, complex topic, uh, but what we would hope that the inshore fishing bill would help to do would be to deliver an uh, ecosystem-based approach to managing fishing in the inshore. That needs to be that needs to consider, you know, spatial management of, of using different gears. It has to look at addressing gear conflict, um, and it, it you know it has to it has to look at uh, how wider management of inshore fishing outside of MPAs as well can, can deliver biodiversity benefits, again, as the biodiversity strategy sets out. Um, conversely, the biodiversity strategy also recognises that, um, and forgive me because I will have said this to committee before, but the, the, that the, um, the MPAs can also help aid the recovery of commercial fish and shellfish. That's something that's actually in the biodiversity strategy. So um, we, we hope all these things can be looked at in the round in an integrated way. Uh, to, you know, to, to get that sustainable outcome that we all want, coastal communities want. Okay, thank you. I'm going to move on to agriculture in a second, but before I do, there's been comment uh, passed today about the opportunity that you have to influence policy that impacts upon biodiversity. Uh, the Muirburn Code is currently being reviewed, uh, and I think we're all aware there are competing views on the, the benefits or otherwise of, of Muirburn. I'm just wanting to touch on what opportunity you may have had to feed into that process, uh, from, particularly from a biodiversity standpoint. Um, Adam Smith. Uh, absolutely, first class opportunity. Um, we warmly welcome the fact that this is now being uh, restructured by Scotland's Moreland Forum, uh, which is a very inclusive body now, very large range of representation. The organisations that are represented on the Muirburn Code restructuring uh, are well balanced and will bring a, a good okay. good depth of experience. I have confidence that it will represent the correct balance of peatland, so soil, um, vegetation, and um, uh, aerial biodiversity as well. Okay, Duncan, over you. Yeah, like uh, Adam Smith, I'm involved with Scotland's Moreland Forum, and we have had input into the uh, Muirburn the development of the new Muirburn Code. I have to say we haven't yet seen a sort of draft document pulling all of the uh, uh, sort of various uh, 
group work together. Um, and like Adam, I mean, we think it's important that peatland conservation has uh, a central role in the new, uh, the new guidance. But also, just I won't repeat what Adam said, but the other, the other thing that we think it, it is critical that this code also covers grass burning in parts of the West Coast, in particular where uh, grass, uh, grass fires form part of agricultural management. Um, because we have had some examples in recent years of some very serious and out of control uh, grass fires which have caused significant damage to uh, uh, natural habitats on the west coast of Scotland. Okay, okay, that's fine. So let's move on and look at uh, agriculture and uh, CAP. Uh, Alexander Bonnet. Uh, really something Duncan had mentioned earlier in, in the uh, percentage of Scotland that needed managing under conserva for conservation. Uh, and the role of the, uh, the private sector. Um, yeah, I'm a member of a scheme, Wildlife Estate Scotland. I just wonder how uh, schemes like that can be encouraged uh, and what role, I know we've mentioned a bit about agri-environment and cap reform, uh, how the two of those will play a role um, given, given current Brexit uh, issues. Do you maybe just, just add to that as well. Um, what are the demonstration farms that are being run by the Game Wildlife Conservation Trust and the James Hutton Institute telling us? Thank you. Um, yes, so try to fit, fit those various elements together. Um, the demonstration farms are, I suppose, uh, there to, to shine a spotlight on some of the issues that uh, Mr. Burnett has actually raised there. Um, their purpose, uh, or the purpose of the farm that we run uh, up in Aberdeenshire, is to demonstrate a real-world farm. So this is one that actually has to turn a, an honest buck on the, on the bottom line. Uh, and uh, show how that can be compatible with uh, wildlife. So, uh, in fact, one of the species, uh, one of the priority species that, um, that's in this um, uh, document, uh, the curlew, is one of our focal species for our farm. What we're trying to achieve, however, is a network of demonstration farms by working with the James Hutton Institute, who have got the splendid uh, facility at Glensoch, and the SRUC, who have got a, a, an excellent facility as well at Kirkton near Crean Larach. Um, if we can actually build those three uh, farms together into a network and we have a joint monitoring proposition already in place and then build further farms onto that, Scotland's uh, land management community, the farming community, will actually have a, a series of places that they can come and peer into, uh, have a look at the mistakes that we're making, have a look at some of the successes that we're actually achieving as well, and go away reasonably reassured that these are uh, real-world propositions. Um, Quite difficult in Kirkton and Glensoch's sense because they have very clearly defined manipulative experimental uh, roles, uh, but that brings their own value uh, easier to look inside what we're doing and to see very clearly the incredible importance of uh, subsidy in its current format and subsidy in whatever new format we will have to deal with after 2019. Um, we're hill edge farmers. Um, as I say, we're, we are tenant hill edge farmers. And it's really driving home to me as a trained ecologist how difficult that life actually is, especially how difficult that life is to put um, a farming system in place and to have an awareness of, how, of, of bringing up families of curlews and families of lapwings and families of other things as well uh, and what uh, agri-environment is going to be needed to do that. I praised uh, agri the agri-environment scheme earlier on, uh, the heading as, as a success. Uh, indeed, it's very important that it's, it's there. It could be improved enormously. Uh, I think uh, this and the other committee, REC, uh, are well aware of the challenges in the delivery of, uh, of EECS, of the Agri-Environment and Climate Change Scheme. Um, the, there is an enormous room for improvement in that uh, delivery and in its, in its focus as well. Um, this committee, I hope, will will take a, as I think uh, William said earlier on, take a really strong role in liaising with with the rural uh, in economy and connectivity committee in making sure that uh, the evidence you receive here is translated across into the the support structures that we see in the future. Absolutely vital. Mm -hmm. Okay, Duncan, how are you? Respond directly to your question. I mean. The, the RSPB is also a member of Wildlife for States. Our Abernethy uh, Reserve in Strathspey was one of the first uh, sites actually to gain accreditation, level two accreditation. Uh, we were also involved with the steering group that uh, has set up, with wild, set up Wildlife for States and designed the, 
the criteria. So in answer to your question, we are heavily involved with that, and that does have a, uh, a demonstration role to play. So I think, I think the question yep. was, uh, I, yep. I know your involvement, that's, that's yep. excellent. It's how, how do we go promoting it more to get more people involved? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, that's a challenge. Obviously, that is funded by SLE internally. They have a project manager who, who whose job it is to, to do that. Um, I, I mean, I understand progress with getting people from stage one to stage two has been quite slow, but I think they're looking at, at ways to uh, improve that. Um, just to say, in addition, I mean, like Adam, we are involved with discussions with SRUC and JHI over demonstration farms. Uh, we think they have an important role to play. We're particularly involved with SRUC at their Crichton uh, site, uh, where we have a partnership project there. I would also highlight the fact our nature reserves uh, also play a critical role. I mean, we have had a long-term partnership, for example, on the Western Isles at Balranald. I mean, we, we manage a site. It actually uh, uh, belongs to the local crofters, uh, but we manage the site in partnership with the local crofters and have been doing that for many, many years, uh, a successful project to demonstrate best practice in relation to agri-environment and management for corn crakes there. Uh, my only sort of final point here would be, I think, with regards to the ARPID uh, suite of monitor farms, there is a case that they could actually do more on those sites to demonstrate best practice for biodiversity. I mean, they do great things for, you know, uh, water quality, um, uh, environmental management and so forth, but they could do more for biodiversity. Which kind of leads me on to asking, how effective are the, the current greening measures within the cap in terms of maintaining and enhancing biodiversity? Adam Smith's laughing there. I should allow him in first, I suspect. <laughs> <laughs> Only because it's such a horribly difficult question to answer. Um, when greening is done well and the spirit of greening is entered into fully, they, it can make a useful contribution. There is no question about that. Um, unfortunately, farmers, many farmers are, not all, but many farmers are very creative people and they will see way ways around that. And um, for example, we see the return of <coughs> effectively the, uh, the set aside area. So um, farmers are choosing to fulfill their greening requirements simply by setting aside a great big lump of, of a, a field uh, and not doing anything with it. And that is neither helpful for soils, nor water, nor birds, bugs, bees, nor anything else. Um, so greening needs to be suitably improved. And um, I think, well, there's arguably the, the, there's an opportunity in Brexit, but actually the, the, the structure of of greening uh, as it was handed down from the European Union uh, wasn't too bad. Um, I think it's, it's a matter of debate that um, the way that it's been implemented in Scotland could certainly be improved. And to be fair to farmers, you would find agreement from them on that? I think that's absolutely true. Yeah, okay. Nobody else want to come in on this. Bruce Wilson. Yeah, I think um, certainly, I mean, whether we stay in or out of Europe, there's gonna be an awful lot less money floating around for these kind of schemes. So it's absolutely vital that we get um, whatever comes next in terms of cap right. And it might not be thinking of it in terms of the pillar system where we have this kind of single farm payment mm. idea and then agri-environment on the side of that. It might be a lot more about just paying for what's provided in general and with reference to uh, uh, Mr. Stewart's point about um, about the WTO rules as well, we'll have to be quite mindful of what we can actually provide for there. That's where I start to favour, certainly, the idea of a, a range of um, land managers being paid for the environmental services that, that they provide, and um, food provision could be one of those services, but it has to be a balance between the other things that we, we seek from our land okay. now. Okay. Willie McGee. Yeah, I think I would endorse what Adam has said. That you know, we, certainly in the in the forestry and the woodland sector, we we've not been that impressed by what, what's come out um, over the over a considerable amount of time, actually, ever since ESAs. Um, and that it's it's a it's a 
an engagement with farmers and landowners and getting them to recognise what they're doing, and usually that will come down to money. Um, the well, the current well, the, the current scheme. If if you look at one of the uh, somebody asked about the the take up of the forestry scheme, one of the things that happened was we shifted the um, farm woodland premium scheme, which effectively, if you put 100 hectares, 10 hectares, whatever hectares on your piece of farm in the uplands, you would receive something like 60 pounds per hectare per annum every year for 15 years. At a stroke last year, we disappeared it, and they get the single farm payment equivalent, which might be a tenner or 20 quid. And then, and then the CONFOR and others in the forest industry wander around asking themselves why farmers are not keen to take up these schemes. <laughs> so okay. that it's a very simplistic and quite a blunt view, but that's, uh, that's how, how our... Nevertheless, uh, nevertheless uh, interesting. <laughs> uh, Adam Smith, just to wrap up on this. I, I was only going to, going, going to come back and say, yeah, yes, of course, money is a, is a very important uh, incentive, but, but so, is actually, uh, so is actually a wide range of other things. And one thing that we consistently come across is, is information um, about uh, what the change might do for you as well, and not just financially. So I'm quite sure that in a, in a, um, a silvopastoral system, so this is where animals are grazed in amongst trees, um, there could be a much better tie-up between various bits of farming and forestry, for example. And the same could be true for forestry and sporting. Um, this comes down to not throwing money at people to do something, but actually giving people more information and more uh, knowledge about what these could do for their businesses. And that's the facilitation bit that I was talking about. Okay, Mark Ross wants to go in with a. You know, we've seen the, the letting of the contract for the farm advisory and extension service. I mean, to what extent is that really building in these approaches to biodiversity? Well, we hope that it will be at the forefront of it. I mean, if uh, SRUC uh, get a big bite of that, um, they have a reasonably good track record in doing so. Um, uh, Catherine might want to reflect uh, on the fact that FWAG and indeed our advisory services um, can can make a strong. You can make a very strong difference to the way that farmers do something with a bit of advice. Um, m most agri-environment schemes can be made to work and work very effectively. Mm -hmm. it, it depends on the level of commitment and the information and advice that the, the um, people on the ground actually get. That is critically important and something that this committee might, <coughs> might just want to press and make sure happens well. Okay, thank you for that. Let's just wrap this up by looking at the Aichi interim report, which indicates that the evidence base is currently incomplete and I quote, collation of data and information across such a wide range of areas from financial resource allocation to knowledge transfer and conserve genetic resources has presented considerable challenges. Can I ask you to identify what those challenges have been uh, to develop in the evidence base, how those are currently being overcome, how you think they might be overcome? Nice and easy one to finish. Who wants to go first? William McGee. Woodlands. Uh, <laughs> um, I, th I think um, if, if we have a commonly recognised um, baseline for woodlands of, of any description in, um, in, a, in a good condition, in a, a favourable condition for biodiversity, that would be a great starting point. SNH have... Um, obviously consulted widely before they developed what they have been using. Forestry Commission used something subtly different. Um, it, like all sectors, you could you could find half a dozen different systems, and I think that um, it would be good to have a common agreement about what a, a, a biodiverse woodland should look like before you send people out to go and measure it and then report back on it. Very fair point, Bruce Wilson. Again, the, the vital nature of the ecosystem health indicators here. I think it's SNH's own comment. Ecosystem health indicators will help monitor progress towards the 2020 Convention on Biological Diversity AHE targets. So they need to be in place in order for us to track progress on these things. Okay. Um, one of the members wants to come in at this point, Alexander Burnett. Uh, just, can I just come back on the forest thing? Are you talking about uh, further clarification on schemes separate to forest certification 
or under the forest management plans, if you're talking about another scheme on top to try and quantify um, biodiversity in forestry or well-managed forest. Right, you've got two or three things going on in there. For certification is. Well, you, you talked about having different criteria for measuring forests. Y yes, in terms of, well, in we terms of biodiversity are, by itself, if we're quite, just looking at biodiversity, yeah, yeah. Um, what happens is that SNH will, will get its surveyors. They've got a system, they've got a, 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 a set of scoring sheets and whatever else, and they'll send people out and you go and do it. Whether those woodlands have anything to do with UQWAS or FSC is. Mm -hmm from their perspective, neither here nor there. But it's um, the point I made earlier about the 80% is because what we, we commonly find is that the, the bar is not set sufficiently high to be able to come back and say that this woodland was in good condition. Um, and that's either because they've not consulted widely enough or there's not been enough round, round table like this input into something, not, not at this level obviously, but round table input into um, the condition itself. And, and does a forest certification scheme not set the bar high enough and should we not be <laughs> encouraging people to go down that route? Well, it, it, sets, it sets the bar. Uh, that's another yeah. discussion, but it's not necessarily looking only at biodiversity. It's looking at a range of different things. Thank you. you. Uh, Calm Duncan. You respond to that. That underlines the importance of a well-resourced marine monitoring strategy, and you know it, the NGOs can also help there. I mentioned sea search. We've also been doing tagging work with the University of Exeter and basking sharks, for example, and that enables me to re-respond to Claudia because I forgot to mention. Of course, um, we are looking forward to four further nature conservation MPAs, including for basking shark, resource dolphin, minke whale. Uh, Northern Sea Fan communities uh, ne next year, but the the the, the investment in to actually get the evidence, particularly with the challenges of uh, uh, marine monitoring and conservation, with it being underwater, is 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 really important. Okay, uh, Chris Ellis. I think the challenge uh, <clears throat> might be a fairly simplistic view. I'm not sure, but the challenge is that uh, Scotland's biodiversity route map has that very atomized structure to it. So you've got your targets and you've got your actions, and it's relatively easy to say, um, has this action been delivered? Whereas then the progress towards the HE targets broadens that out again and takes a much more global perspective on Scotland's biodiversity progress. And by its very nature, it's going to be more challenging to gather data at that scale. Thanks. And finally, I think, Adam Smith. Very, very short point to say, um, we're not specialists in this area at all, but colleagues from the JHI, the James Hutton Institute, have reflected that it's getting, it's been very difficult to complete a very simple thing here, which would have helped enormously, which is the habitat map of Scotland. Um, we do seem to have been waiting for this uh, extremely important inventory document for a very long time. And I was distressed to hear that it might even be even longer now. Um, so again, the committee might just want to be aware of that uh, B5 HE target B5, habitat loss halved or reduced, and it says by 2019 the habitat map of Scotland will provide us with a comprehensive baseline. Well, just can you all make sure that it really happens? Because without knowing what we've got, it's pretty hard to conserve it. Okay, and on that note, uh, <laughs> can I thank all of the witnesses for their contribution this morning? I think I can speak on behalf of the entire committee and say that's been incredibly thought-provoking and helpful. Uh, we'll take your evidence away and um, deliberate on it. So, again, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to suspend the meeting briefly to allow the witnesses to leave, and we'll reconvene in a few minutes. Thank you.
Okay. Um, so let's recommence the meeting. The third agenda item is for the committee to consider petition PE1490 by Patrick Krauser on the control of wild goose numbers. Um, that's consideration um, that follows a response from the Cabinet Secretary. We have a number of suggested approaches um, in front of us. Does anybody wish to comment upon those? Angus MacDonald. Thanks, Convener. Um, this petition has been with the previous Racky Committee for, for some time, um, and there's clearly still an issue, uh, particularly on the islands, but it's now spreading uh, over to the mainland as well. So um, I think there's uh, certainly an argument to await the publication of SNH's review of goose management, uh, and also to approach um, the petitioner, Patrick Krauser, to get some feedback from him on exactly how uh, he feels the, the, the progress has been going, and perhaps get some detail from the, the crofter's point of view as to uh, whether progress has been made or not. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Convener. I would very much support what Angus MacDonald is saying, and I think that it is very important at this stage to get that information so that that's ready when um, we we see the SNH review. And having been a member, like yourself, convener of the previous the Raki Committee, this is a problem which um, is really, if not intractable, I, I'll be careful what I say, but is, is a real challenge and needs to be addressed both from the point of view of biodiversity but also from the point of view of the economy of our highlands and islands. Okay. I think the message that's come out loud and clear from the committee is this is a matter that we take very, very seriously and clearly will pay a lot of attention to the content of the SN, SNH review of goose management. So are we happy to proceed on the basis suggested, which is in the first instance to await the publication of SNH's review of goose management policy, and we'll consider that in due course, but in the meantime to write to the petitioner asking for his input on where he thinks we're at with this issue, um, with some specific points worked into that, and then we'll take it from there. Sorry, uh, Finlay Carson. Bloody question. Is this only restricted to the, the West Coast Islands? Is, is there potentially uh, issues that could arise in other, other areas where migratory geese? Um, I think, as, as um, Angus MacDonald touched upon, we have uh, problems on the mainland. I mean, there have been issues in Aberdeenshire, if I remember correctly. So yeah. this is a problem that is um, more than simply the, West, the Western Isles. So can we ensure that, that they do look, open this right out, not just to the basis of the petition? Angus MacDonald. Well, I was just going to say, Convener, um, on the previous committee, uh, the, the former member, Alex Ferguson, did highlight that there was starting to be a problem in the Solway as well. Yes. Yeah. And, and quite, there's also an issue in Orkney, which the previous uh, committee witnessed for itself. So is it, there's, a, there's a, a sightedness here that this is a Scotland-wide issue. Uh, Emma Harper. Um, I spoke to Chris Rawley from um, RSPB at Mercehead actually on Monday, and he said that the issue in the Solway is they don't want to go down the road of lethal scaring, that right now they seem to be quite OK with the management and the numbers, especially for barnacle geese, mm -hmm. although they have issues with the grey lag. Right. So, but to, to revert to the original point, we're happy to take that approach. Uh, having clearly indicated, I think, from this, the last few moments, that this is an issue that we have a, a considerable interest and in, will continue to have an interest in. So we're happy to proceed on that basis, yes? Okay, thank you for that. Um, at its next meeting uh, of, on November 8th, the committee will take evidence on its budget scrutiny from Marine Scotland and SNH. Uh, as agreed early, we'll now move into private session. I ask the public gallery to be cleared as the public part of the meeting is now closed. Thank you.